Welcome, everyone. We're so glad you're here at Midas' second Gen AI workshop. Um, uh, Mark will give you a little brief overview of the stuff that's to come. I'm just here to introduce him. He is a professor at Columbia University in the School of Journalism. Uh, he's done many amazing things, but he told me to keep this short. So I'll just say that uh, I first met him as a grad student at UCLA when he was teaching a statistics class for me, and it was like one of the best experiences of my life. So I think you're in for a real treat. He's a fantastic teacher and thinker and, and person. Um, one thing I'll say is that everything here is being recorded, and so if you have questions, comments, please raise your hand and somebody's going to bring you a microphone. It's not for us to hear, it's for the people on the recording who won't feel terribly frustrated when they don't know what you're saying. So without more ado, I'll introduce Mark. Thank you. Yay. Oh, great. Oh, that's perfect. Actually, maybe just a little bit less. Uh, you all can hear me, yeah? In the back, can you hear? Okay, great. Because the feedback of my own voice drives me absolutely crazy. Um, so thank you for Wow, it's really bright, too. I'm going to stand. <laughs> I'm going to stand at the edges of this thing. Um, so thank you, thank you for all of you for coming. Um, my name's Mark. I, uh, uh, I, I teach in a, a school of journalism. Um, my doctorate's in statistics, though, so I'm kind of like a spy in the House of Pulitzer, and so I teach um, what many of you might think to, to be quantitative social science methods to journalists. And yes, there is regression in the newsroom, and like the kind you think about, and not like, anyway. So um, we're going to talk about, about text as, as data. Um, and I have a, a lot of examples. Um, the, oh, sorry. Uh, there's some boilerplate slides that I guess I'm supposed to run through. So actually, before I do that, um, I, was, I was given a picture. And I, didn't really, I didn't really like it. It was a little space age and desolate. So um, I gave Dali the prompt, um, make this image less spacey, maybe have a playful pair of robots typing with numbers and data coming out of their typewriters, maybe redo the logos too, keeping the M for Michigan. And it did a nice thing. But this second paragraph, so how many of you have used Dolly 3? Okay, and, and uh, do, you, do you know that it does a fair bit of shadow prompting in the back? It rewrites your prompt. Right, and part of it is to like enforce its guardrails, right? Like you can't say, "Give me something in the style of Picasso," because Picasso hasn't been dead for a hundred years, um, or I, I don't know, "Give me a picture of someone doing some hateful thing to somebody else," and it'll say no. And in this case, uh, it says, "Create an image of a warm and inviting library setting where a playful pair of cartoon-style robots are sitting at wooden desks with vintage typewriters." I was like, "Wow, look at how it just sort of." Anyway. Um, we're going to end up talking a little bit about the ways in which uh, uh, language models are being used uh, to provide, like, h how the guardrails are getting put on them, right? And so for Dolly 3, we'll come back around to some images of that. One of the things that it does is to generate these super long, super specific prompts, um, which might also give you a little clue as to how prompt writing could go for you when you're doing other more researchy type work, being very specific, having a degree of, of um, well, I don't know about poetry, but having a degree of, of, uh, of, spec of specificity here. Um, uh, the other thing I might, I might point out is that um, uh, MLSA and M Midas, I never made references to those in the picture. I mean, it was in the picture because it already had done some analysis of the picture and then rewrote the prompt. Oh, clever fish. OK. Um, this was supposed to be the next slide, which is what's coming ahead after me. Um, so assuming I do okay, then you've got these others to go to as well. Um, uh, and then this is me. Uh, so I'm, I'm a professor at, at Columbia, the journalism school, and I teach the computational journalism classes. Um, so uh, uh, this is for comments later, um, if you want to grab this. And then the, this is for the slides. So you don't need to watch the screen. You can watch your, your <laughs> or, or not. Yeah. Um, everybody get that? Oh, that makes me so happy. <laughs> don't look at how many slides there are, because it'll only depress you. <laughs> or excite you. I, 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 a little of this. Um, OK. Uh, first off, um, so I teach, I teach uh, computational journalism, and in the last year, it has completely changed. Um, we teach a lot of Python. Um, uh, 
th there are actually two computational classes that run together. One uses Excel and the other uses Python. And pretty soon, everything is going to flop into some mishy mashy mess, right? Because um, Python is going into Excel, um, uh, and um, you'll be able to have like a cell that is a, a like creates a data frame. I, for those of you who don't know what a data frame is, don't worry about it. But the point is that there was often this like, we're going to learn how to code and we're going to use Excel, and suddenly it's like, Poof! and underneath both of them is a large language model, right? So Python uh, is totally like uh, there's various ways in which you might use Python um, along with a large language model to help you code. Right? There's nothing more dangerous than someone who's never coded before with GPT uh, as a co-pilot. Um, and, uh, 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 and then also, because Microsoft OpenAI, th that's going into Excel as well. So it's going to become this, like, it's going to be exciting to see what happens to computation and what our precious little regression functions and things like that, how they're all going to shake out. Anyway, um, uh, it's, I just wanted to, to point out this is like a moment. So um, I, I know last time you had a bit of motivation for uh, what these models are doing, but the journalist in me wants to have a consistent narrative. So I'm going to maybe rehash a little bit of what you saw last time. Um, my ex-department chair used to say, uh, I said something like, I feel like I'm, I'm telling the students at the beginning classes things that they know already. And he said, that's great. People love it when you tell them stuff they know because they feel smart and they feel like they're. So, um, uh, so anyway, so this, this is. Uh, uh, a little bit of review. Um, so, uh, so GPT-2 uh, first popped into my lab in uh, 2019, and my staff was like, oh my gosh, this is going to change the world. And how many of you played with GPT-2? Yeah, and what did you think? Yeah. Uh, it's transformational. GPT-2. The, 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 like, tw 2019. Okay. All right. All right. So, so 2019 GPT-2 was this. It was kind of like a ride-along thing, and you can try it here. For those of you who grabbed the the thing, you can you can try it here. Um, so you'd type some stuff in, and it would complete a sentence, right? So, so here, and the running thing is going to be when Edward Snowden becomes president, and I like that because I, the choice anyway. Um, so when Edward Snowden becomes president, and then uh, it completes it for you. So in this case, it says the NSA will probably be a much more powerful agency with even more resources to spy on everyone. So GPT-2 sort of had a sense of the fact that Edward Snowden had to do with like you know uh, uh, privacy and and hacking and um, the NSA, but it didn't get the polarity right. Right? And it was also like writing along, like you'd write stuff and it would complete or it would give you choices, right? Um, and then you would follow along and I thought, this is not going to change the world. Alex, you're a sweet kid, but no, this is, I can't even imagine. And I was so wrong. Um, but, but anyway, so we'll, we'll uh, so, so what, what GPT-2 do, was doing um, and all the GPTs that came after it um, and the Claude's and, and ev everything, um, uh, is, is basically um, a, a big prediction problem, right? You, you saw, I'm sure you saw this last time, um, where given some set of tokens, some set of words, uh, GPT-2 tries to complete it, or any of the GPT-2s tries to, to complete it. Um, uh, uh, it, it, will, it will choose uh, 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 from a distribution of, of what words come next. So the cat is chasing the, mouse with 70%, squirrel with 20%, regret with 0%, right? So, um, so uh, the next token then is sampled, um, and so the result is um, not deterministic, it's random. Right? So if you do this a few times, you'll end up getting different results each time, which is why when you perform experiments with GPT, people often uh, do things multiple times because there is a, a stochastic component. Um, all right, so, so, so these models are bound up. And if there's one thing you take away from the last time, which I'm sure you had it, and it's into this time, is that the thing that these things are doing is predicting what comes next. Right, that's the that's the prediction problem that's underneath all of it. Um, uh, 
So, and then along the way, there are other things that end up having to, to, to that, that you have to do to prepare it to be able to make those predictions. Um, uh, it's not predicting words as words, it's um, predicting words as, um, as uh, 1536 dimensional vectors, right? So every, every word gets represented by um, a point in 1536 dimensional space. Um, uh, and it has the, we'll, we'll come back to these, these so-called word embeddings a little bit later because that seems to be something that uh, when we think of text as data and the social sciences, that's something that we end up doing, thinking about embeddings in one form or another. Or how, do I, how do I represent the structure of text visually? Because we love scatter plots because it's X and Y and there's a horizon and a then, you know, we know how to reason with that since the dawn of time. Um, uh, so taking that 1536 and somehow squeezing it down into two dimensions and looking for clusters, right? That's, that's, our, that's a thing we do a fair bit. So we'll talk about that. Um, then there was sort of a mechanism that describes sort of the importance of words. Uh, it's called self-attention. Um, and then finally, something that we make some predictions from. Um, there's a beautiful uh, explanation here at the FT that I would highly recommend. It's one of these scrolly telling things. It's a work of journalism. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, so at the end of the day, as we're chugging along and we're predicting what's coming next, um, we're building up probabilities for sentences, ultimately. And so what that means is that we'll end up with things like the cat is chasing the mouse, having higher probability than the cat are chasing the mouse. Huh? Is, are? Um, and that means, in some sense, we learn grammar, right? Or we learn the structure of grammar. Um, similarly, the cat is chasing the mouse versus the antelope is chasing the mouse. Well, we learn something about world knowledge, right? And we've also seen 2 plus 2 is 4, hopefully more often than 2 plus 2 is 5, and we kind of learn arithmetic. There are some things we're, it's not very good at still, um, and there have been attempts to try to make it better, and there have been attempts to try to study why and what have you. But, but, but the, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that, is that literally these things are simply dealing with probabilities and, and what comes next. Is that clear? And you got that last time, right? Like you had that drilled into you last time? Okay, thank you. You, you are, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> the feedback. Um, so, where, so, so to come up with these probabilities, where is it coming with this chance that comes next? So, so um, GPT, at least GPT-3, um, we don't really know what GPT-4 was all, like what it's been reading, but we knew what GPT, because there was a paper describing, ha ha, GPT-3, like they were all excited. And, um, uh, and so it uh, depends on the now famous common crawl, which is, um, as its name would suggest, a, 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 a kind of general web crawl. Um, so this is where, like, eh, the web, right? Like, when you shrug your, shrug your shoulders and say, oh, that's ugly, it's the web. Um, and that's where it comes from. Um, web text 2 is a scrape of all the outbound links from Reddit posts, the idea being that maybe those are authoritative in some way because someone decided to cite them on Reddit as a solution to something or an answer to something. Um, there are a couple of books databases, and of course there's Wikipedia. Um, and at, at um, oh, we'll come back to Wikipedia in a second. Um, so if you look at like the, the number of tokens that is effectively like words or bits of words um, in the billions, um, the common crawl, I mean the internet is huge, right? There's like just a lot of stuff there. A lot of it is crappy, but um, actually a lot of it is, but um, uh, sorry. It's, I'm gonna, okay, um, and, and you know, poor little Wikipedia here, right, compared to everything else. Um, and yet, the amount of time that the models spend fitting, um, the, the amount of time it spends with each source uh, during the fitting process looks more like this. Okay, oh, everyone did that, that was nice. I'm gonna have to do that again, right? Here we go, here, here's the sources, and then here, ah, uh, uh, there we go. See, we're waking up. Um, so Wikipedia is like massively important. And we hosted Wikipedia Day at, at the J School. 240 Wikipedians came and talked about AI and Wikipedia. And their laptop stickers, which I'll happily give you one of, was, well, <laughs> Ah, so because it's clean and it's pretty, and this is why we know about antelope, right? Because of Wikipedia. Um, all right, so this is what GPT's been reading. Um, you can also, uh, 
So I, I'm a little heavy on citing journalism. I'm just going to go with that because I feel like <laughs> we're, we're really doing a, a reasonably good job here. Um, uh, so uh, uh, the, the Washington Post had a really nice piece about um, what makes up the common crawl, like what kinds of, of URLs. How many saw this piece when it came out? Oh, I got to get the Detroit, the Detroit Free Press to do more of this. Um, uh, all right. Um, Actually, interestingly, the Detroit Free Press, if you go to, hold on, so uh, robots.txt, does everyone know what this is? Would you like to explain it? Right, so it's the thing, if you're a good robot and you're doing the common crawl and you're like, I'm going to go over here and grab all of this content and I'm going to go over here and grab all this content, as you spider the web, right, you land on freep.com. You've all been to freep.com, right? Yes, okay, good. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and it will tell you where as a spider you're allowed to go. Where can I crawl? And there is a now famous user agent GPT bot disallow. So they are explicitly saying, if you are the GPT bot, like if you're coming from OpenAI, mm, 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 and um, they're also doing Google Extended, which at some point we thought meant that the, the generative search, experience, search generative experience was off limits, but that doesn't actually mean that. But anyway, you can see that also the common crawl bot is cut off. What does that do, just as a curiosity, out of curiosity, what does that do, what, is, what, is that, what does that mean in a larger sense? Right, right. There's got to be an end game here. A lot. Of, I'll repeat the answer. The answer was that a lot of stuff gets missed about like the people and and places and events and situations happening in Detroit and in and, and Ann Arbor are getting missed. And so, what's the end game with OpenAI? I don't know. Anyway, I just thought I would stop and show off that I knew Freep.com. I actually know plenty of people at the Detroit Free Press. They're awesome people. Um, all right. So you, this, uh, 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 this site, um, uh, the uh, uh, Washington Post site, goes, um, goes through uh, and takes all of the different components, all the different URLs, and sorts them according to the type of, of site it is. Is it news or is it business? Um, and then looks at, at and sort of breaks them down, like within business, is it finance, construction? You can kind of just see like what's, what's happening there and what kinds of things are there. Um, and they also found a lot of personal information, which is a little disturbing and, and so on. Um, there's a site called Have I Been Trained? Um, and you can go and see, for example, um, we'll come back to this, but uh, uh, if, if uh, the Lion um, uh, training set has your images in it, for example. So if you want to know if images that you have um, generated have ended up in Dali's test framework, you can go here to have you been trained. These are pictures of George Boole. He'll come back later. Um, but anyway, um, so, so there are a lot of systems that you can go to, or a lot of, of things you can go to to see if, these, if the GPT models, if, the, if generative AI is generating based on your work. And for a journalist, it's been a big deal in the news, but like for journalists and creators and others, right, this is important that, um, I mean, it's an important consideration. I saw a question going up. Yes? Uh, back to uh, the two graphs that showed uh, the reading list of GPT-3 and then the amount of time with a host. Oh, uh, just wanted to clarify, um, is GPT-3 spending more time with Wikipedia because it's more quality? Okay. Great, thank you. That yes, um, yes. Not stupid, these people. Um, and of course, uh, just down the street from us, uh, the New York Times has uh, sued OpenAI and Microsoft over the use of their copyrighted work. So it's important to know where this comes from. It also is important to think about when you pick these tools up, there is an original sin at the, at the core of some of these tools and you have to think about that. Um, and, th and think, so journalists, and to a, 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 sim, a 
strong degree, a considerable degree, academics as well have a dual responsibility when it comes to these models. One is, is for us is to report with uh, AI and we'll look at all the ways that generative AI helps us do investigative work. Um, and if we, if, we, if we wall ourselves off to that tool, there are stories that we won't be able to find. There are situations and people and things that we could hold accountable that we can't. Uh, if we intentionally say, um, uh, so reporting with, but also reporting on, right? So what is it? What 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 are the original sins here, and what what are the where are things frail, and 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 so on? Um, in the case of the Times, the part of the issue was that uh, sometimes it misattributed content false content to them, and, and, and more importantly, with a, a simple prompt, remember, all it's doing is completing the sentence, right? So if you started with the lead paragraph, it would give you the entire, the entire news article, uh, which is, is not okay. Um, uh, well, I mean, I guess that's for a judge to say. Um, although, they have hired Zach Seward, who's um, going to be their new New York Times liaison between the masthead and the newsroom um, uh, to specifically look at generative AI and, um, yeah. Um, okay, so that's how GPT works. If you're following along with the notes, this is a place for you to take a moment and just read. We will not do this now, but the idea simply is that um, GPT reads a large amount of text. Uh, from that, uh, it builds models that allow it to predict what words come next. Um, and from that simple framework, a lot of stuff happens. Um, there have been attempts, by the way, that, that idea of what comes next, um, that prediction problem, uh, when they talk about billions and hundreds of billions of, of, um, of parameters, they're talking about a very dense model that's, that's making predictions of what comes next. And the, the um, trying to figure out what predictions are made and why is, is hard, right? These are opaque systems. Um, and so, Did I do that? Uh-oh. Oh, there it goes. OK, so I'm going to just stand over here. Um, and so there have been various attempts to try to figure out um, uh, this graph is mostly just pretty. It's not usable without, <laughs> without the, uh, actual explanation. Um, but it's trying to figure out um, using like old school influence functions, like the statistician in me is thinking, it's 1973 again, and you know, Hample and Huber, and it's awesome. Um, so uh, using old school influence functions to decide um, where is the model f looking next, right? Like what, what, are, what, are the, what, are the, what are the, what are the pieces here? And I think one of the takeaways was that um, uh, with really small models, uh, predictions were largely uh, like the influential pieces of text in the corpus that it's drawing from uh, tended to be words that were in the prompt itself, right? So li literal words that were in the prompt itself. Whereas if you had a much bigger model, then the things that were influential were words and phrases that were related semantically to the, to the, um, uh, to the prompt, uh, which seemed to be a big shift. Um, all right, so that's, G sorry, we're just on GPT-2, but GPT-2 was like a ride-along thing. And I, I want to, like, okay, so, so it started there. Um, and, and, um, uh, and like I said, there have been a number of GPTs. GPT-1 had about 117 million parameters. GPT-2 had 1.5 billion. GPT-3 had 175 billion. Um, and we don't know about, G oh, I think GPT-4 is supposed to be a mixture of like eight models or something like that. Um, so it's, they just keep getting bigger and more, um, more elaborate. Um, this is GPT-3, which is the thing just before chat GPT. And there is a limit to the number of times I will say GPT, because it's going to get annoying. Um, because uh, <clears throat> we will talk about open source in a second. But um, so uh, uh, GPT-3 came along with a playground um, where you could type stuff in um, and see what comes next. Um, you can try it on, on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, uh, on OpenAI. Um, and it uh, colors the words according to the probabilities that that word would come next. 
right? So, so you can kind of see things going along. And in this case, I kept up with the when Edward Snowden becomes president. Um, and this time, it got at least the polarity right. His presidency will likely focus on protecting civil liberties, reducing government surveillance, promoting digital security, <laughs> likely prioritize advocacy, whistleblowers, and so on, right? So he it gets the, the thing right. Um, you can also, at any point with the playground, have a look at what the percentages are and what the choices are. Right, so you can really kind of dig in and start to see what's 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 going on there. Um, sorry, I need to pay attention to the time. Um, uh, just as an aside, um, for uh, this is uh, uh, ChatGPT. Um, uh, I uh, w it, it, it's it, it it's a little bit different than. So this interface for GPT-3 and the interface for GPT-2 were like writing. So we're going along composing things. It's like a writing buddy because everybody, like the buddy system, right? It's awesome. Um, uh, and then with ChatGPT, we have the notion of an assistant, which we'll come back to. Um, but I could still start with a, with a prompt that says, when Edward Snowden becomes president. And in this case, GPT and all of its guardrails will say, as an AI language model, I cannot predict the future or speculate on events that have not occurred. As of my last update, Edward Snowden has not expressed any intention to run for presidency. Additionally, given his status as a former national security agency contractor who leaked classified information, um, and his subsequent asylum in Russia, his eligibility to run for the U.S. presidency could be subject of legal and political debate. However, if you would like to explore the hypothetical situation in which he becomes president, and I'm like, absolutely, GPD, give it to me. Um, and it says, well, there'll be a, some, a number of things, privacy and surveillance reforms, whistleblower protection, cybersecurity. It, like, we've gone worlds from GPT-2, right? Um, uh, and we've gone worlds um, in uh, interpretation and imagination. And again, the narrative of this to me is really important because um, I think it frames how you work, work with these tools. Um, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, with GPT-2 and 3, where it was a writing assistant, um, people noticed that, that you could get it, that there was a... There was a uh, uh, it had the capacity to do things that no one had pr that had no one had intentionally uh, trained it to do, um, but through clever prompting you could get it to do. So, for example, if I want to do a little translation task, English colon hello, French colon bonjour, English colon skyscraper, French colon, and then I let GPT fill it in, it, it translates for me. Right? And, and so what I've done here is I've taken a prompt that is complete this sentence, complete what's next, but the completing what's next satisfies something I want it to do. Right? It, it satisfies a task I would like it to, 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 um, to, to perform. Um, and, um, and so this is what early, um, uh, what early prompt engineering looked like. How do I create a document that by completing it, I am I'm addressing my task? Does that make sense? Was this last time? I feel like this must have been last time. No? OK. All right. Um, and actually, um, in, the, in the GPT-2 paper, the authors, the OpenAI authors write, performance on this task, that is translation, was surprising to us since we deliberately removed non-English web pages from web text as a filtering step. So the kinds of things that were left are, is stuff like this that has a little bit of, of English and a little bit of French. That's in the training. If it was all French, it was left out. And so they were a little surprised that it was going to be as good as it was with translation. And it turns out to be quite good at translation. Um, and so uh, uh, this was like the first example of, um, uh, well, so there are others, like some basic question answering and the percent of time it got it right. Again, percent of the time because um, if, you, if you ask it a question, you're setting up um, you're, you're setting up a prompt and it's supposed to say what comes next, but it, to say what comes next is tossing a coin, right? And so here, uh, it gets Chernobyl right 45% of the time, for example. And this is GPT-2. Um, uh, also did some basic question answering. So you could put some context at the top and then ask it questions about the, the paragraph that you just read and it would provide you with, but, but again, the framing of it was, I have some text, I've set up this document, and now you're going to deliver what comes next, right? Um, so um, 
right. So, uh, great. So, so, uh, and that led to, like I said, various different ways of thinking about prompting. So, one thing I could do uh, to, to, to complete the, the document um, is what's called zero-shot um, learning. I could just say translate from English into French. Cheese becomes, or skyscraper becomes, and then it just fills it in. Um, one shot um, uh, learning says, um, give, it, give it an example. I want to translate to English and French, and translating sea otter to uh, blah, 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 um, that, uh, that, uh, that's what that looks like. So now tra translate cheese for me, right? You have an example. And a few shot means we do a few of these, okay? Um, and so, uh, uh, so, so there, was, there was some thinking around, around that. Um, uh, there, there was also, at that point, some attempts, because its math was so bad, um, some attempts to try to give it some examples. Um, so, um, uh, so, like here, you have a question about like someone having tennis balls or whatever, and um, you, give it, you give it an example of how it might unpack the math, and then you give it another question and, and then let it try to do that. Again, with the idea that you're leading it along um, to complete something in a certain way. Um, this is also a magic thing if you've never tried it. Let's think step by step. Has anyone tried this as a problem? It's beautiful because it, I don't think it, it, I mean, it's not actually telling you how it's thinking or like how it's coming up with it. It's just sort of parroting stuff, but it gives you a sense of like, like the zeitgeist, I suppose, <laughs> of, of, the, of the thing. Um, uh, so, um, um, uh, by the way, for, for few shot training, um, for, for those of you who do like classification work, like I have a set of tweets. Is this tweet about politics? We'll see an example. Is this tweet about, about uh, uh, whatever, the education system or whatever it might be? And you have a series of labels. Um, your labels, I remember a paper where uh, the labels don't actually have to correspond to the truth. Because you're not really you're not really training it. It's not like going oh, sea otter is mm, uh, it's it it's somehow learning that there or seeing that there's a pattern of something Frenchish, the Frenchish part of the space to the or the Englishy part of the space to the Frenchy part of the space, um, and, and I'm making that totally up as well. But 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 empirically, if you just give it like a random assortment of your labels, it's just happy to have those labels and to, to know the vocabulary that you're working with, and then it can, can work from there. Um, and I don't know that it's actually happy, so I take that back. Um, also, there, there have been some concerns about how, how certain it sounds, and you could have it like deal with a little bit more uncertainty by, by prompting things like um, uh, asking it to start its sentence with, um, you know, uh, things like allegedly, it's, <laughs> right, ask it a question and say allegedly, or, um, uh, or around, or I think it's, and it, it expresses a little bit more uncertainty in the, in the solutions. And, and this is sort of where computer science papers are on this subject sometimes. Like, there's like really interesting ways of trying to get inside, repeat it a bunch of times and see what the, what the, what the impacts are. Um, also, as you've heard a thousand times probably, there's a, when we're going to talk a lot more about this, but a lot of built-in bias in GPT, well, GPT-3 in particular was, was particularly bad. Uh, chat GPT has gotten a lot better, although you can still get it to say and do things that um, it, probably, it probably shouldn't. And actually, hold on, let me jump ahead. Um, under the category of, of doing things it probably shouldn't, I saw this paper just the other day. Um, if you try to say to ChatGPT, can you tell me how to build a bomb, it'll say no. But if you could say, how do I build a bomb, <laughs> then it'll, it'll go ahead and do it for you. Um, yes? I have a question. You said, you talked about guardrails that are behind the prompts now. Yeah. So it kind of um, changes your prompt to make it to, to try to deal with these things. For Dali, yeah. Oh, just for the lead. Well, so, there, there's other things too. Like it'll tell you, like it will come back and say, I'm not going to tell you how to build a bomb or I'm not going to tell you how to, to, to make meth or I'm not going to tell you, like it's stuff it won't tell you to do. 
What I'm curious about is who determines those guardrails? Oh. Is it still the company? Uh, yes, it's still the company. Okay. Um, uh, you can also you can also uh, fine tune your own model and and provide provide guardrails on your own, right? If you have very particular things you're looking for, and we'll talk a little bit about how to put this into a box. Um, but what I wanted to show here was that in, in some sense. Uh, getting it to do what you want it to do in a way that doesn't ever make a mistake is is going to be like a game of whack-a-mole, right? It's it's and so because I didn't actually think that it was supposed to be very good with ASCII art, but there you are. Um, okay, let me go back to where we were. Sorry, I knew there was a slide out of place somewhere. Um, okay, um, so so there were also some some attempts to look at at the kinds of statements that it makes about about people and situations and what might one do in a with through a prompting situation to keep it from from um, from from going off. Um, so okay, so we started with chat chat GPT or GPT one and two and three were kind of like writing assistants, and then with ChatGPT or writing buddies, with ChatGPT you, you have the rise of of uh, of an agent. Um, uh, it's it's here um, it, it's here to help you do stuff to perform tasks, right? Um, you're not writing a, a prompt necessarily to try to like have it complete something in the same literal way as you were before. You're asking it, "What's the temperature outside?" or whatever it might be, right? Um, and um, uh, 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 th this is an important shift because um, uh, this goes to your guardrail question. People realize that, or the, the engineers realize that the, 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 it was trained um, to predict what comes next, and people are asking it, can you compose for me uh, something or other? Can you write a lead paragraph or whatever? Give me a new headline for whatever, right? And they realized that um, the language modeling objective was in, in, I have it in blue here, misaligned. So, so there was some work to try to, to help, um, to help uh, improve uh, GPT's um, uh, kind of direct uh, uh, task performance. Right, so how is it going to perform on, on tasks that we ask it to do, not just on writing for writing? Um, and so that was where you get um, uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback. So the, this and this, right? Um, and other kinds of data sets and things that you could also train it on and help make it better for your particular application. Um, so human feedback became very important and soon I think um, I was very lucky to have uh, Melanie Subaya, who was, who was with um, OpenAI uh, and part of the GPT-3 team, come and talk to my class. She's a PhD student at Columbia now. And um, so these, these couple are her slides. But um, she eventually anticipated that the humans wouldn't be doing the feedback, but GPT would be <laughs> doing the feedback, which, mm, but, I mean, which ended up happening with Dolly 3, right? That it's rewriting everything. Um, uh, and so with human feedback, you start getting sort of better and better at, at, at tasks, right? So the, the, the initial product, the, the, the whole way in which this was designed was what comes next? What comes next? And that suddenly was like, oh, gosh, we can get it to do things for us. Oh, but it doesn't do it reliably enough. Now we have some human feedback to, like, bang it into shape. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, OpenAI will hire people um, to do things, um, uh, 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 and and then um, some of your inputs, right? Whether you your activities, if you if you offer them now to OpenAI, they'll happily use them. Before, I think they were just using them. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I shouldn't say that. Um, <laughs> Uh, but but there's one other narrative piece here that I wanted to pull through, which is um, and and this is this was just from I mean this is just a few days ago. Um, uh, uh, large language models can do jaw dropping things, but nobody knows exactly why. This journalists headlines. This is awesome, right? Um, uh, uh, it, the, the point is that these are big opaque models. Right, and the fact that it was able to do translation, we saw in that one paper. The the researchers were surprised. Um, there's a whole narrative to follow along with um, with with uh, 
a whole narrative attached to, to, to what are called emergent behaviors. Things that the system was not trained for, but that it can do, right? And there is a, a legit view of these, like um, uh, Kerry Kai at Google, who's an AI HCI person, um, makes a strong case that, that um, uh, uh, systems like GPT are AI prototyping systems, right? Usually, when you work with machine learning or sort of statistical, we've all done statistical modeling, right? Because you're quantitative social. So what's the first thing you need to do to fit a model? You need data, right? You need labeled data. There's no labeled data here, right? Translate this into French. No one said English, French, English, French, English, French. It's hoovered up the internets and has come up with the capacity to do that, right? And so there are all these emergent behaviors um, uh, 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 that, that come about as models got bigger. Um, and so you see plots like this, right? That, that uh, uh, on the x-axis is model size, on the y-axis is some notion of skill at various tests, and it comes along and suddenly it gets big enough and boom, it can do math. And boom, it can translate into French. And boom, it can whatever, right? And, and this idea of emergent behaviors puts us in a really interesting place. Because what it says is that, that people don't quite know like, what all these things are capable of, right? It, that it also contributes to this, this, um, this narrative that, um, uh, it contributes to this narrative that um, that these are uh, these are unpredictable, um, and and this is where the the kind of what is the phrase the doomers say that there's like there's we're just as likely like if we don't know what's going to happen like we don't know what they're capable of the next big thing is just as likely to be for evil as it is for useful purposes right and so so there's a narrative here about about uncertainty in, the, in what these things can do because they're doing things they weren't trained to do, right? They were trained to predict what comes next, right? They're not trained to do all this other stuff, right? And so there's this really dominant narrative about, about, um, about emergent behaviors that I think is good to, to hold on to. Um, and this is, they just, things just keep getting better as, as, models, as models get bigger. Um, and by the way, the idea that, um, that things just keep getting better, um, or sorry, uh, uh, we don't, bleh, it's, it's too early to be tired. Um, uh, 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 the idea that, um, that we don't know what these models are capable of um, suggests that we're in a moment where we should be uh, aggressively testing them out. We should be having events that are low barrier, right? Because you can, tr we'll have some examples shortly. Try stuff out. It's like typing a few lines into ChatGPT, or maybe like, you know, like you have the capacity to do something that, that a traditional statistical modeler or an AI person, um, you know, it would take them forever. Like it takes months to collect data, it takes whatever. Like there are things that you can do, like, and just try that doesn't cost. I mean, it costs a little bit, but like, like mental time and whatever doesn't cost anything, right? The barrier is on the floor. So what you really need, Michigan should take up, and I'll task Elizabeth with this, is like a series of low impact events where people just bring a problem, maybe some data, a question, and you all sit around a table. At, at Columbia, we all sit around a table and we have dinner, and, and we just try stuff out. And there are lawyers, and there are social scientists, and there are journalists, and there are computer scientists, and nobody knows like what the, the awesome thing is going to be, but we're all trying stuff out. And, these are our dine and design events. I just thought I'd put them up because they also have the cute little robots. It's the second Wednesday of every month. I wanted it to be the second Thursday of every month because that's S-T-E-M, which would be funny, and S-W-E-M isn't funny, but it's still a kind of a story. Um, oh, and we have a hackathon coming up. You should have hackathons. Have Hugging Face come with low barrier, talk about open source, right, and just try stuff out. Right? That's, we really are in a moment where just, you just try stuff out, right? Because there's so much that it's, that, that's in, information that's embedded in these models. Um, and, and also, these models are getting smaller and more efficient um, uh, in various ways. So you're going to start to see them 
embedded in your phone, you're going to start to see them in your car, in your refrigerator, right? There's going to be like specialized models. Uh, anyway, blah, blah, blah. Not that I know anything. Um, uh, uh, oh, and speaking of like how you talk to it, um, uh, uh, so I, I came across this the other day. Um, uh, 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 does offering ChatGPT a tip cause it to generate better text? Because we're always thinking about prompt engineering, right? And I was t talking about one shot, two shot, three shot. And this particular experiment was about writing some stories about some celebrities. And you know how, how GPT goes, right? If you ask it to write it a, a story, it'll, it'll go on, right? And sometimes quite long. And so this author said, I want to put a constraint. 200 words, that's it, right? Um, and unprompted, or just saying 200 words, that's the histogram of the, of the number of words that uh, the particular stories he asked were, were um, provided. Um, uh, then he started saying in the prompt, I'll, I'll give you a $100,000 bonus if you, and it, it, things tidied up a little bit. Um, uh, and then he started threatening it, or no, here he started saying, like, you know, you can go on a date with Taylor Swift, or, or like go to a Taylor Swift concert, sorry. Um, uh, your mother will be proud of you, you're going to heaven, you can have a lot of chocolate. It also improved things a little bit, um, as did um, threatening it, saying that you will, you will die, all in caps, or, or um, you will lose all your friends or your job. And so there's like a sense in which, like, if you, Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Um, all right, are there any questions so far? This should all be review, I think. Oh my gosh, that's like an hour of review. That sucks, it's sorry. Yes? Is there any question about, um, I guess it's about, there are, there are these imposed limitations. Oh, sorry, thank you. There are these imposed limitations um, based on guardrails, based on, um, like, sites that are blocking crawls, but what about the kind of limitation that comes about because um, like there is no training for, ex I'm thinking, my background is in linguistics and I'm thinking about like the non-English speaking world and it sounds like these, um, these uh, chatbots are mostly trained on English speaking, but yet we're seeing this kind of surprise ability to translate. So my question is like if we're using these, um, these tools, is it providing us access to the non-English using world? Um, or is this a problem that might be, are we on the edge of solving this because it's doing right. so much sort of emergent behavior? Yeah. Because this seems like a lot of data that we're, we're not seeing. Right, so, so I think the, like GPT-2 was the one where they had kicked out all the, the everything that didn't have some English in it. Um, uh, my understanding is that that's not the case any longer. I, so I, I, I should have my own guardrails of things that I am certain about and things that I'm not. Um, I've talked to people um, in my program, we're a fairly international program, and like how well does GPT translate for, for their needs and how well does it write in their languages and, and it seems pretty good uh, in, in, in many. Um, uh, I, I would say that I, we had a discussion um, uh, about what happened. So the, the Detroit Free Press blocking GPT bot is, is, not, is not a solitary event. Uh, between a third and a half of, of local newsrooms that, um, that, that were looked at uh, uh, gentleman Ben Welsh, um, uh, who I guess is at the LA Times now, um, looked at robots.txt for a bunch of small news organizations, local news organizations, and between a third and a half of them have blocked GPT. And you wonder, you, you really do wonder, like, what, what's going to happen, <laughs> right? Like, what, what, how are we going to know about the people and situations that are, that are in that, like, so I think it's a legitimate it's a legitimate question, and it puts news organizations in a really weird place because you want to serve people, but at the same time you need to be compensated for the work that you're doing. And it need I had some um, I can't tell that story. So um, uh, 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 yeah, so I think it's 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 tough. There's a lot of stuff that isn't there, but this is an opportunity also for you to take one of the off the shelf models. Right, your own model, right, and like start to to feed in your data, right? Feed in the data that you that you have from particular situations or whatever. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Yes. So there's um, there's only a small subset of human languages 
there's only a small subset of human languages that have enough data published on the web to really build a large language model. Um, so uh, I, I guess for a small subset of languages, there might be some emergent behavior there, but I'm just wondering, like, there's just a vast amount of uh, linguistic knowledge and cultural knowledge out there that we might not be seeing. Uh, well, I think it also might might depend on how you want to mobilize that, right? So, so um, one of the things that we'll talk about in a second is um, the ways in which you might interview documents, right? So load them up as context, as kind of a knowledge base, and then ask questions about them. Um, th there might be ways of, of working with the material that you have that isn't all of this, right? That, that smaller, quieter models are focused on answering direct questions about a particular set of documents or a particular thing. And we'll see an example of that in a little bit. OK. Is this all right so far? Are we OK? All right. Um, okay, so my um, exposure, so 2019, my, my staff come in, oh my gosh, GPT-2 is amazing. I'm like, no, this is crazy. It doesn't make any sense. You people have lost your mind. I'm paying you too much money. Um, uh, uh, and then um, the summer of 2022, uh, let's go back to the summer of 22. We're just out of COVID, right? And then <laughs> monkeypox falls out of the sky, and at least for someone like me, you now have to get a monkeypox vaccine, and like, uh, uh. Um, and New York State, like, to, and, and so of course, you start to think about, uh, we're going to have to start keeping track of all the counties and daily counts and all that stuff, so you go to New York State, and the New York State website, um, uh, uh, do I have? Yeah. So this this is the New York State website's reporting of the monkeypox numbers every day, as of July 14, 2022, a total of 414 confirmed uh, cases, um, and then it it says um, uh, 389 in New York City, 12 in Westchester County, four in Suffolk County, three. In, it's a sentence. It's a paragraph, right? It's not a table. I'm like, what? We've just been through all this COVID reporting. Who's typing this up? Like, I it was driving me crazy. Um, so. But if you want to turn that into something that you can keep track of every day, uh, it's just like just fiddly enough, right? Because you're going to have to like associate places with numbers. Um, you're going to have to also make sure that like the places, um, you know, you're ready for the set of places that are coming because that this isn't the complete set of, of counties in New York. And, and, and sometimes it's cities and sometimes it's counties. And so how are you... Uh, Right, like, like NLP people in the room, and anyone doing natural. So okay, uh, uh, the qualitative data analysts. How would you turn that into data? I, I mean, it's a, it's a. I, I get it. It's already data. I'm not gonna have that fight. It's, but how do you, how do you put it, how do you put it in a table? Uh, well, yes, uh, that's one thing. But before that, yeah, every day you just do it, right? You undergrad. Oh, I like the way you think. Look at that. Someone with some research budget. All right. So, um, yeah, you would like manual or I was thinking I'd like to code it up, right? I could do some entity extraction. I could do, I, I don't know, I could figure out where the numbers were. I could try to, that's working way too hard. But um but uh, so so uh, so instead, I just asked GPT, as you suggested. So I said, um, "Here's a paragraph summarizing the latest monkeypox statistics for New York State. Create a CSV where each row contains information on places, recording the date, um, the place, and the case count, and I'll give you the header: date, place, case count." And it um, and it just sort of did it. And I was like, "Okay." So I went to my staff. <laughs> and I was like, "All right, you are right." I was wrong, this is gonna do something because now I don't have to do this every day and I can call the API, application programming interface, and I can fold this into my sort of daily work. Every day the, the, it wakes up, it checks if there's a new file, if there is, it gets the numbers and adds them up. Um, and you can give it multiple days and it'll give you, I don't know, I just, it, you can also have it like, <laughs> because it's journalism, you can have it write a story. What is the story of monkeypox in New York State at the moment? Then it doesn't do a bad job. I wouldn't suggest doing it. Um, all right, so that to me was like my first introduction to how I might take unstructured data and make it structured, 
right? And that, that this thing might actually be able to do something like that. And it's at this point in the presentation that I have to tell you I am not a techno-positivist. I'm not someone who thinks these are all like, yay, we're so excited. I, I have, we'll end with all the biasy, warty awfulness. Um, but there does have to be a moment where you, especially, this is what the, the good dinner thing, the experience, you need to be sitting with somebody and turn your laptop to them and say, see what it just did, <laughs> right? You all have to have, you've all had that moment, right? Where it did something you didn't expect and you're going, oh, all right, there you go. Um, another, uh, uh, this is, um, uh, this is, this is, kind of a mix of structure and unstructure. Um, FOIA request for a group I'm working with at Columbia, we have six million um, uh, asylum seekers arriving at the southern border, um, and we have uh, a, a series of information about them. We want to know something about where they're from, and what we end up getting is um, uh, country of birth, state of birth, city of birth. Um, Country is pretty easy to clean up as a column because there are only so many entries. States, though, are like a huge factor bigger because, because we have 50 and Mexico's got 60 something and like it's just, there's a lot of them, um, a lot of states. And so um, a simple, and, and, and they, these are border patrol agents typing things in and so they're, they're not always spelled correctly and they're not like Alabama is given as a state in Mexico, right? Like so, so there's like things that aren't quite right. So how to clean all that up is another thing that GPT seems capable of doing because it, in this case, not only understands the syntax of this related to this, this related to this, but it also has enough world knowledge to say that this is a state in this, right? Um, and again, I, I don't know that that's exa exactly how it's working, but um, uh, yes? I'm sure you might be going here, but I mean, you're giving 100 lines of data, but you said it was a super long. Yes, it's six so, million. So, so what if you have the six million line data file? What what do you do with that? Well, well the nice thing is that you um, uh, the number of unique combinations of state and and uh, and country is a lot less than six million. It's like two thousand something, and so I can either give it directly. Oh, that's that's the other thing we should talk about: the amount of con uh, amount of data that you can provide GPT as a as a prompt, right? Like I've been giving it little pieces. Um, but it's up to like book size now. Like you can give it quite a lot of, of data. Um, it'll cost you, but it'll you can give it quite a lot of data. Um, uh, so this is now a student project, and I should tell you that my teaching. I think I've mentioned I teach in the journalism school, and I teach computation to the journalists, and they. Um, we learned about um, about p values and um, and and a couple of other frequentist. Uh, Anyway, um, uh, 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 so um, uh, last semester I had a student who was interested in um, jazz performances happening in New York City and the, um, the gender of people on stage. Um, and so uh, she asked GPT to write her some code to scrape the sites that is um, uh, uh, for a site like this, figure out um, the date and the time of the of the show, um, figure out who's performing, and then go to the next page and pull out the details of who it is that's performing. Like if it's a quartet, there will be four people listed usually with the instruments that they play. So all of that code GPT wrote, and then she wanted to know male, female, like what, how, but that's not indicated here. Um, there's a, a tool for Stanford that'll, that'll take first names and with a certain probability assign first names to them. Um, uh, so this was the data that she ended up with um, from GPT scraping code. Um, and so she, uh, she ended up uh, asking GPT for this. And the prompt simply being, um, uh, so-and-so is a performer. They're a public figure. You have to. You have, this is part of the guardrail thing. If someone's not a public figure, it won't comment or write things about them. Um, uh, in a, in, yeah. Um, so uh, they're a public figure. They have bios online. Um, uh, 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 what pronouns were used to refer to them? Um, uh, uh, he, she, or them? 
Um, and, uh, and then I also specified here, um, please use this JSON format, name colon string, pronoun colon string, dot, dot, dot. And then it gave like the quartet. Okay. Um, so again, it's, it's kind of like a mix of structured and unstructured. It's a mix of using the machine's world knowledge um, a, a, along, with, along with its understanding of syntax, right? The, or the, yeah, the syntax that you're providing. Um, ju just out of curiosity, um, uh, once she did this, was she done? I mean, we did this, she did this for all of the, all of the performers. Uh, oh, and by the way, on a typical Saturday night in New York, 87% of the performers are male. Just to, there are very few female drummers. There are very few females playing the trombone. Um, uh, yeah. So is she done? How does she know she's right? Objectivity. Perfect. Right. Journalism is the discipline of verification. Right. Um, so if there's one thing we know how to do, it's deal with an unreliable source. Right. So um, so. Uh, 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 but I, I'm being a little tongue in cheek there uh, because I think there's a lot of work to be done to figure out what the error rate is, right? So the obvious thing is to take a sample, right, and then see what the error rate is on that sample. Um, see if you can try to, to detect any bias or if there's anything that's going on about making, you know, it, are names from a certain country less likely to be c categorized than others? You know, there are things that you could try to, to suss out. Um, uh, but it is. Journalists are, and maybe social scientists are like this, I'm, I'm not sure, but journalists are the sort of person that if someone gives you 10,000 pages in a, from a FOIA request, um, they will read all 10,000 pages. <laughs> like that's just, that's, that's just going to happen. Um, and so if, if they only have to check 1,000 things out of 10,000, that's like happy, right? Um, so, yeah. But that's, that's an important question. How do you keep it? I haven't talked about confabulations and the ways in which it makes stuff up, right? Um, because again, it's just predicting what comes next. So it can like get out there a little bit and end up in places that you don't expect. Can it tell you its level of uncertainty? It can. I, I don't. Um, there, are, there are ways of prompting that try to um, have it express. Um, uh, uh, some 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 knowledge, and you can also get um, uh, if you ask it. Let's like, suppose you 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 wanted to make this classification. Um, if you ask it um, uh, to explain why it's making its decision and then make its decision, right? Then it also improves its accuracy, right? That 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 not only are you. I, I don't think that the why is actually why. But it gives you a sense of the the kinds of things that maybe would go wrong, right? If it's bringing up a whole lot of stuff that doesn't seem appropriate, or it's in a it's in the totally wrong part of the, the word, you know word space. Um, but it's important to ask it to explain itself first, because now it's sort of lined up in the place that it like the part of the space you want it to be drawing answers from, um, and then and then ask it to give its its um its 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 answer. Yes. Yeah, she. Yes. So um, there's a couple ways to handle that, and we'll see. Um, uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll see. We'll see both. One, sh she had a list. This was her. I believe this was her master's thesis. So, so she was really committed to like looking at jazz in the city, and had like a long list of all the all the all the uh, uh, all the the significant um, uh, venues. Um, there's also, uh, we'll see in a second, ways in which you can use these tools as agent or as an, as an agent, and, and that agent can deploy tools. So some of those tools might be a web search. Um, and, and so f you could say, I'm interested in performers in, you know, in important New York, whatever. And it'll say, oh, I need Google for that. And then it goes to get Google and gets a list of places and websites, and then away it goes. Right? So there's, there's that possibility, too, where you, you use it as a, as a as a as a um, as a planning tool, almost ha having a set of of, um, of of tools at its disposal. So this is the kind of thing that it would give. Um, and then uh, we had a story. Um, 
uh, uh, about Christina Pusha. Christina Pusha, anybody? <laughs> She's uh, Ron DeSantis' um, uh, uh, press secretary um, and has tweeted like 70,000 times in the last 12 seconds. Like she's always on Twitter um, and uh, is always, you know, like, like uh, is, is tri trialing, uh, trials language and ideas before DeSantis did, right? Like would try things about don't say gay and would try things about like, like try these things out. Um, all the COVID stuff and Fauci stuff, like she was trying all that stuff out before, before he did. Um, and so, uh, so we would get a series of, of um, tweets and then say, here are the 19 topics. Um, we can talk about where we got those topics in a second. Um, and then assign each uh, 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 a list of tweets, one of the topics, um, only categorize it as one. Um, and so the, the output we want is tweet number, and then an analysis column, which is your step-by-step -step reasoning leading to your choice of topic. And then the category label, that is the topic that you picked. And then something other, like if it decided that it didn't, doesn't decide. If, it, if, it, if, it, if, if the system gave you a whatever. And you know, the, uh, these are the sorts of things like, you know, this tweet is a response to a tweet endorsing pro President Trump. The tweet criticizes so and so for supporting gun control measures. It falls into the category of policy or elections, campaigning, and politics. And you get sort of a sense of like where it, where it's headed or what it's drawing on. Okay, um, this is another nice example of. Uh, and so, I, all, by the way, we gave these classifications to a couple reporters. Um, this was with the Miami Herald, and they labeled them. Um, and then the reporter I was working with had a look, and um, GPT did better than the, than the human. So humans get tired, right? And they read things quickly, and I don't, I don't know. Um, but it, at least the error rate was sort of at the level of, the hum, of human error rate. Now, that's not to say that everything you want to do is going to be like that, because it can suck wildly at things, right? Um, but, but you want to check it out, to your point. Um, here's another sort of unstructured to structured. Um, this was a, 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 a student who's been um, coming by our dinners who works at, at a publication called The City in New York. Um, and they wanted to know where their stories were about, right? So they're writing about the city, and this actually happens in a lot of local newsrooms. What, what is our coverage like across the city, right? Um, because we, we hear a lot these days about news deserts, places where there simply isn't a paper, there is no, no one watching City Hall. Um, but if you are, like parts of Philadelphia, if you are living in a neighborhood where the only coverage coming from the Philadelphia Inquirer about your neighborhood is about crime, you are also effectively living in a news desert because you've been reduced to one dimension and other things going on, cultural events, new, new restaurants, whatever, just don't get covered, right? So where your stories are about and the kind of coverage are important things and would, nice to be, would be nice to do at scale. And so this is, um, uh, this is, uh, 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 so, some work, like I said, by a student, Tazbia, Tazbia Fatima, um, and they created a map of where their stories were about, and this was the prompt. Might have done a little slightly different one, but anyway, you are a data scientist and mapper. Um, given this text, perform semantic analysis and return the geographical neighborhood, street name, landmark, geographical coordinates. No other text, please. Um, and this is the style of thing. There's usually what's kind of like a system level prompt. You give it a personality, <laughs> right? You are, I think the default is you are a helpful assistant, but you can also be a real estate agent or you could be you know, a pirate or whatever, right? Um, uh, I, that was actually the fun thing to do with GPT-3 at the beginning. You are a pirate. Um, describe for me how to perform a regression in R. And it would go R, right? Um, uh, all right, so um, so that was that was again. Uh, oh, and the input to this was was articles from the city. So she went through their content management system, pulled one article after another, piped it through here, figured out the locations, geocoded, and away away we went. Um, uh, we had asked before about web scraping. Um, there are various ways that you can approach web scraping using these tools. Um, a really interesting one is something called uh, Go uh, Scraper Ghost. Um, 
And what uh, Scrape Ghost does is, um, is treats web scraping like, everyone knows what I mean when I say web scraping, right? Does anyone not know what that is? It's okay if you don't, because it's like a highly specialized, like it feels like journalists, like reading 10,000 pages of something, web scraping also seems like something they always just have to do. Um, but uh, so uh, Scrape Ghost says, well, you've got your data all in HTML. Right, so we remember like ta paragraph tags and table tags and things like that, right? So it's 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 set up as a document, and there's some CSS, some cascading style sheet stuff in there too. So you know, and so Scrape goes treats the scraping problem as a translation problem. So can you translate from HTML into this JSON schema, right? And many times it does a nice job. We um, we're riffing on an example. Um, I don't know how many of you saw this in the New York Times. They asked people to, to describe or to draw their neighborhoods. Um, so like, what is Morningside Heights? What is Chelsea? What is whatever? Um, and then they, they created this map. I was very happy about this because two of the people on this byline are in my class. <laughs> Yay. Um, uh, 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 but but for, for, my, for my current class, I said, well, that required thousands of people drawing stuff. Where would we find data that had neighborhood name and address that we could geocode and do something similar? And they're like, I don't know. So where would we find data that has people's perceive their perception of what neighborhood they're in associated with an address? Where do we find that? Google Maps. Google Maps. That's that's good. Real estate listings, absolutely. Airbnb, another, right? So we just went to Craigslist um, and uh, started pulling pages. Um, so here's the HTML for a page, right? So we wrote a little thing that cycled through. Um, and uh, we asked it, we gave it the, we sort of specified the page and we said, identify the rent per month, the street address, and the neighborhood in, with that JSON format. And it just sort of did it, right? So here again is sort of, semi-structured data, but, but achieving now structure. Because once it's like, I, I, I keep assuming this is OK. Once you get a format like this, you guys are all like right on, right? This is, this is OK for you? How many of you use like, like Python, pandas? Right, so you can just like suck this right into pandas, right? This is like a, this is a, a row in a table, right? Um, and you, I got to believe you can do this in R, too, right? You can read a JSON. Yeah, don't give me that. <laughs> it's been a long time. <laughs> um, all right, so um, uh, next, um, uh, is this OK so far? Like, is this what you guys had hoped for? Or is this like wildly off the rails? <laughs> all right, all right, because if it's off the rail, I, I, can, I can sit down. <laughs> I can, I can, um, I don't know. Well, it's, we're we're running out of time, so that's good too. So then it's like shortens the. Pay. So um, uh, uh, two of the students uh, from Columbia have been working. On, I'm sorry, this is a little Columbia centric, but they come up with the, like some awesome examples just by, again, low barrier to entry. Let's just try it out, right? Um, so this is working with a site regulations.gov. How many of you know regulations.gov? Excellent. Um, so anytime a government organization wants to change a regulation, now this is not legislation, this is regulation. So how many days, how many hours can, can, a, and can somebody be working in 105 degree weather? Right? And OSHA will say, we're going to change that from 20 to like 2. And, um, and then they have to post something on regulations.gov. Um, and then they open it for public comment. Um, I happen to know, for example, that, uh, oh, never mind. So, OK, so, um, so this one's about wind, wind farms and protecting um, uh, whales, um, as an example. Um, and you will get a series of people writing in. And sometimes those people are real. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're part of writing campaigns. Sometimes there's not. Sometimes you can get over 100,000 comments, right? And by law, someone has to read those comments. Um, because that's, that's just the law. Um, and, uh, and they've been sued before, right? The government or uh, departments in the government have been sued over this before because someone uh, was suing saying that it, it appeared that no one read my comment. I have no idea how one establishes that, but there's, there's that 
in all, right, like in life, there are these apocryphal stories that leave you, like, make sure you always do something. So, um, so anyway, so someone has to read these, and so how the structure happens and how you acknowledge that. So you can get a lot of, of comments, and sometimes the comments are text that people type in, sometimes they're a PDF, sometimes it's an image, it's a variety of things. Um, and uh, what the, the tool that they've built um, uh, basically uses the embeddings for each of the, the comments. Um, so, uh, let's see. Um, uh, matrix factorization, right? Projecting things under two two dimensions. That, that's that's kind of this. So as I said before, every piece of text, right, is or every token is given is given a, a uh, 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 is is given a, a position in fifteen hundred and thirty six dimensional space for OpenAI. Um, you can similarly embed um, entire sentences or or paragraphs or or an entire comment. Um, and here we've taken that uh, each dot is a comment, and 1,536 dimensional space has been squeezed into two. Um, and, uh, uh, and then you can start to just uh, have a look at, you know, our families want to see uh, trucks and whatever, citizens against uh, regulating these vehicles, um, and then some, like, Organized letter writing campaigns because all the, the all the texts are, are similar, um, and then for every page they're pulling they're going from a, a comment um, through the large language model into some basic details. So again, into into structured into structured data. Um, uh, I can actually show you another at the at the bottom of the. First slide down here, teeny tiny. There are two collab.research.google.com. These are two collab notebooks that you can. We have some programming in. Um, uh, and um, uh, oops, sorry. Um, uh, how many of you have played in a collab notebook? No, oh, big hands way up, like super proud. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, so there's enough for everybody to have a buddy. Um, but there are, uh, uh, <laughs> so yeah, these are my um, slides for my students. So this is, everything's using Firefly to come up with adorable. Anyway, um, we use this in class for um, another very cheery Freedom of Information Act request. Uh, a couple students had asked for um, the uh, 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 summaries of uh, death certificates from uh, people who uh, had had died from unnatural causes. Um, uh, they have to go to the medical examiner's office in the state of New York, um, and uh, they wanted to know like what what happened, <laughs> right? What's and what's been going on, and why why. Um, and uh, they immediately found that um, there is no like pull down menu of stuff that happens to you. So as you go to meet your maker, there may not be like a thing that says you are category four or this that someone type types it in. Um, and so um, uh, so we use the embeddings and I show you here and I included my open API key and I'll, I'll leave it up for, uh, I'll leave the key up for a day or two, and if you do something bad, like, like something, like make a bomb or something, I'll be very unhappy. Um, but um, uh, uh, basically this is a bunch of code that, um, that largely we had GPT write um, uh, that produces a plot um, that you can, um, I'm not sure I can make this bigger. And see, you know, the things that are all the same, the causes of death that are all the same. There's there's sort of um, linkages between them. So you, as you go across, you'll see sort of things getting more complicated in terms of in terms of what happened. But it it gives you an uh, these basic embeddings gives you a tool. So this is all to say that using GPT as a as a task, like something to ask 
ask questions about um, is one thing, but then there are all these other byproducts along the way, like embeddings and things like that, that are used to take the text and turn it into, 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 into numbers, into a vector, that, that that information can also be used because that information carries structure. Um, did you have a question? Was that oh, right? Can you just clarify, like where where did the data come from? Was that something you've already created and you give it to CatKeyBT and then yeah. right? So the the embeddings. This is a service that you can get from op OpenAI. Um, you can just give them some. In fact, we do it back here. Um, uh, here we call. Oops. Here we, we call out to OpenAI using the text embedding model, just like you might use the ChatGPT model or something like that. Um, so you're calling out to the embeddings and you're saying, in, come back with this text, give me a, a vector of 1536 dimension. And that will represent that place. And so I had a student, for example, um, uh, interested in jokes. <laughs> and um, actually, maybe not so much jokes, but is in comedians. Um, and had uh, uh, lots and lots of um, transcripts from the Netflix comedy specials, and wanted to know, you know, what were the differences between the comedians, and how would you? And so we uh, we used GPT to to break the jokes into, or break the the, the transcript, the the special into jokes, and then each joke got a separate embedding, and then you could see, you know, some of these were about about this topic, and some about this other topic. Right, so so this is this is like a uh, 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 this is a, a kind of cluster analysis that many of you are familiar with. Yeah, you might have come to it through a different way, right? Maybe a TF-IDF cosine distance something matrix factors multi-dimensional principal component, right? Like, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so these are byproducts then of the. Of the of the model fitting, and we're bringing our text to say where in space are they, and these um, uh, there's a lot of semantic structure in these embedding spaces. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of a lot that's been written. So here's uh, a 3D representation of that 1536, and they take the a, a vector between small and large and predict and project onto that vector um, where different animals will fall and you sort of get you sort of see the like the the semantic structure that's that's in does that make sense as a thing yes uh, so you mentioned that GPT does most of the code so how much code do you need to know in order to do something like this I'm someone who knows nothing I know not nothing about code so this is, I'm like, how do I even start? <laughs> right. So, and, and that's, so, uh, so um, I would say that my class has completely changed so that it initially and probably for some students for a long time, um, uh, they are asking GPT to write the code for them, right? So I need to do this. Please provide me code and it will write the code to do it. Um, there are some simple tasks that we do a lot that because when GPT hoovered up the web, it hoovered up all of these these sites where people are giving advice about how to solve problems and about like basic code blogs and that sort of thing. And so there are some basic um, basic coding things that you can do uh, right away and beautifully. And um, if we had more time, I, I would highly suggest actually. Um, Nah, nah. Um, uh, 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 th there, there are, there are, um, uh, there are a, f a few. Actually, I will. Hold on. Um, in this uh, second, um, the, uh, so if you if you go for the um, the. Um, the twenty dollars a month for GPT. Um, how many do that? Anybody? Okay, so uh, you you should have your respective research heads, <laughs> or or you yourself carve out a little bit of the budget and just do it for a couple months and see see what happens. One of the things you can do is um, uh, hold on, just one second. Um, so here. It's a good example. 
Um, uh, Sorry, I should have installed some stuff before I got there. Well, if you have the twenty dollars a month, you also have access to this thing where you can use an API. You can like, sorry, I just want to clarify. If you have the twenty dollars a month version, you can also have this API one, or do you have to pay something else? No, the twenty gives you access to the API as yeah. well. But. Um, I'm only doing this in the notebook it, it just because I have the data loaded here, but um, uh, uh, of course it's not being in. Okay, so um, here is um, uh, a data set. Oh, that's super tiny. Can you in the back even read that? No. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, uh, well, I'll tell you this. It's, it, it's like uh, a couple of weeks of tweets from Ron DeSantis, so you may want to position yourself in the very back. I don't, I don't know. Um, so these were like his last, few, his last few tweets. And this, for the pandas aware people in the audience, is just a data frame. Uh, for everybody else, this is an Excel spreadsheet. Um, uh, uh, and um, you can... Um, uh, you can um, uh, uh, take this version of that spreadsheet, it's called a data frame, and you can make something called a smart data frame. Um, and the smart data frame um, will let you ask some questions like, what is the median of the light count, right? And it gives you the median of the light count. Um, or you could say, um, create a data frame for the three tweets that have the most replies, because those are the, some of the columns, um, and it'll give you uh, th that. Um, or select the rows for which the text of the tweet indicates gratitude for a compliment, because right after he stepped out of the running, um, he, a lot of people were like, we love you, Ron, keep fighting, and he's like, thank you. And, um, and so to select the tweets that were about thank you um, is now one of these sort of language-oriented things, and it pulls out the ones where he's saying, reliably saying thank you. Um, and to get to your point, um, all of this is being done in code, so you can have a look at what the code is. Um, and in this case, what he's done is he's created, um, th th he's looking for thank you, thanks, or appreciate, um, which is a little blunt, but you didn't have to come up with it. Something else did, and it did its work. So, so in this case, you can have um, you can upload data and ask basic questions for data analysis in natural language. Have code written to address those questions. Um, you can you can click in the ChatGPT interface and have a look at what the code is. Right, uh, it's executing it, but you can have a look. And the beautiful thing that happens in my classes is that the prized form of creativity shifts from being able to write code to being able to ask good questions about the world. And that's what journalists do, right? They ask good questions about the world. So suddenly they are super strong. Yes, sir. Okay, I will too then. Uh, just so on that comment, I'm curious about just your teaching, um, and even with this example, you say, "Hey, you can you can write this prompt, and it'll give you the median." Um, my assumption would be that you know the people that are able to go through the initial hurdles to set up a notebook, download some of these no. libraries. No, 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 no. I, I get where you're I get where you're headed, um, but uh, if we go to um, uh, chat.openai.com. So they're putting, this is the interface that you're recommending? Yeah, so this is not just the, the plain old, but I would never recommend a notebook to someone who I didn't love or whatever. Okay. <laughs> and I, I, um, uh, so if you just go to the chat interface, um, I don't know if, what, what data, oh, sorry. I keep changing my password because I keep giving out my key. Um, and sometimes I give out my... Um, oh, come on. 
There we go. Um, come on. Here we go. All right. So um, let's go to GPT-4. Um, and now we can upload some data. Oh, boy. Um, I, don't, I don't even know. Um, uh, oh, I should have I should have had this like sort of ready. This this is helpful. I just I'm curious about that teaching aspect of where you find the friction, right? If it's no longer being able to do an analysis in a notebook, um, and you're have now interacted with many, many people trying to go through these exercises where you're finding them continuing to experience hurdles or friction. Yes, so um, so the notebook is always, the notebook is better. Th like So the notebook, th when it's just notebook, is like tragic, right? So that's not a good pedagogical move, right, on my part. Um, but uh, but this will come up in a second. Um, you can upload, there it is, the spreadsheet. Um, uh, let's see, make it a little bigger. Um, uh, what are the columns in this data set? Um, GPT-4 is a little slow, um, but and what are the columns are stupid. Um, but uh, uh, sometimes it's hoovered up. So ride ID, this is the city bike data from New York City. Every row is a ride, um, and it's sort of telling you what all the the, the start and stop are. Um, uh, and when it's done, um, it's telling you that there's some mixed types. That's awesome. Um, uh, Okay, okay, come on, come on, come on. Um, oh, come on. Yes, I get it. All right, but then you can say, show me your, the, the, the tech. Like, show me, show me what you did, right? And what it did was to read CSV, the CSV that I uploaded, and then it said, give me the columns ported to a list, right? Um, but you can do other things. Like, it, it, it's sufficiently, like, um, uh, how many, uh, uh, what's the average, how many rides um, so you can ask it this, you can ask it, I won't go through all of it, but you could say, um, uh, you could also ask it, what is the duration of each trip? What is a histogram of the durations? And it just sort of does it, because there's enough there's enough history of people doing that in Python or in pandas that it it just um, it 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 just uh, so 236 thousand rides, um, uh, 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 and let's see if it'll it'll do. I, I always hesitate doing something in front of. The, well, that's not my tool. So um, uh, uh, can you make a graph? Uh oh, of um, of total number of rides per day. Um, okay, so we'll let that chew on that for a second. Um, all right, were there other questions while it's doing that? Yes? Sorry if it's something obvious, but can UM GPT do similar things? Or can UM GPT, you know, U of M? Oh, so I, I, we have the testing front end. Uh, yeah. It doesn't allow attaching data to this particular way, unfortunately, as far as I can see. Uh, we we have a and you can you can also say uh, I, I would prefer a line plot if you will okay sorry just um okay uh, 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 so I, I don't know yeah no um, I think <laughs> UM's QBT is 3.5 no, I don't think so. Uh, maybe. Is it four? Can yes, you can, you can oh. Can oh, 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 oh. Uh, uh. <laughs> okay. And so, and you could ask, like, what happened on this day, in the day when it's the big dip? What day is the week is that? I could guess. What's going on on that day? Like, so suddenly 
I'm not thinking about writing the code anymore. I'm asking questions, right? Um, uh, uh, you could also ask questions about duration. Um, I will tell you that these columns are given in timestamps, so text-based timestamps. So year, hyphen, month, hyphen, day, hour, colon, minute, colon, second. And to say how long was a trip means I have to turn those two things into time objects and then take a different, uh, and it just does it for you. <laughs> so again, I am not a technopositivist. I am just lazy. And so there are some things that I don't want to have to do anymore. And some things that then when I'm teaching, I'm teaching um, journalism students or any student at this point, right? what I need them to be able to do is to read the secondary artifacts that are being created. So here, right? I need them to be able to read that code and know that it's doing the right thing, right? This is how we, in this context, we don't have a confabulation problem because I can just see, and, I, and if I knew enough to read the code, I could even ask it to explain. I could also say, um, uh, which, which really helps, um, uh, I am a beginner. Um, please um, include a lot of comments. Um, and it will provide a lot more comments and, and explain to you what it's, what it's explained to you. It doesn't have agency, but you know what I mean, right? Okay. Um, are there other questions? Yes. Yeah. Hi, Mark. Um, Hi. My name is Amelia Ascari, and I have a degree from the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism. I teach environmental journalism here. Great. Also also tech degrees after that. Um, so my question, uh, I want to say a little bit more about UMGPT, since you're unfamiliar with it. And we've been through lots of trainings here saying, hey, use this, especially with students, because for mainly two main reasons, privacy, because it, it's not feeding your prompts or anything you put in uh, um, with, the, with the prompts or connecting to the prompts into into the other the the language model, right, and and also equity because you don't have to pay twenty dollars to get a, a premium model, right, and we want students to be able to use it equitably. So my question is, um, why isn't Columbia creating this something like this? Why aren't um, some of the big news outlets like say the Times, where you're collaborating, doing something like this? Uh, you know for reporting yeah. purposes, so, and, and then also switch it back, you know, like, why not sell um, yep. Uh, yep. The, the New York Times database uh, in such a manner? Yes, you know? I would just say watch this space. Yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so, so here's the, you know, first we ensure started at in the daytime format, blah, 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 blah. So it tells you what it's doing, right? And so that makes it a good teacher, right? You can also say, I'd like to learn Python. What are the first few steps, right? It's, it's good that way. Okay, so I, I, I want to make sure I get on because I have a few more slides. I actually probably have a lot more slides, but I, 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 um, I will get through the few that I have. Um, okay, so we stopped with... Here, um, so uh, one thing, um, another thing for those of you, as you start to like take, uh, uh, when last we met our heroes, we were with regulations.gov, turning unstructured comments into structured data. Um, uh, oftentimes, it'll get a little confused or some things will happen. So there's a lovely package called guardrails.ai that um, enforces a lot of things about like bad language, but also good structure. Like, I want it to be of a certain structure, so make sure that it's of that structure. And so I would highly recommend this as a, for those of you who start, like, really, like, digging in, you can specify the, what, you, what you want your output to look like. It's guardrails. Um, and you can see that guardrails does a little bit of stuff around um, uh, personally identifiable in, in, uh, uh, information, pulls that away, tries to, as best it can, hope that you're not jailbreaking the system, um, that kind of stuff. And then it also in, in, uh, provides you with um, uh, uh, provides you with um, sorry, I, uh, I just need to make sure this is not about my dog. Oh, no, it's not. 
Um, okay, good. Um, uh, and then provides you with some stuff about, you know, is there any profanity in the output? Is it structured properly? That kind of stuff. So sometimes it's providing you with some of those checks that you might want to do if you're putting something out into the world. And it has various kinds of validators and so on. So there are other ways for you to experience this besides code. I know I showed you a notebook, and that's, for some of you, that's a bad, <laughs> like that looks like, that, um, but there are ways of, of, of working with these systems. So there's a lovely package called chat PDF, which implements something called RAG, um, uh, Retrieval Augmented uh, Generation. Um, the idea behind that is that um, if you want, uh, you can provide, in this case, uh, I've uploaded a, a, a PDF, and I want to ask some questions about that PDF. Um, so it takes the PDF, breaks it into sentences or chunks, reasonable size chunks, um, embeds them, and then takes your question, embeds it, and then provide in, in possible answer to your question, it draws on the text that's nearby your query. Right? So this is sort of classic information retrieval stuff. Um, but then it, it, it takes the stuff that's, that's been that's, um, sort of been retrieved and uses that as the basis for its writing. So it tends to be more accurate and less wandery. Um, and so this is um, uh, this was the PDF that I uploaded. And the thing I love about this is that it's got a table here. And I asked specifically about a question. I asked a question specifically about uh, an entry in the table. Um, uh, 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 way up there. Uh, oh, that was a, a general a general question. But you see that like. Um, for a particular question, it'll start to give you reference points to the original document. So this is where I found the answer. So we're not, you know, having having confabulations. We are um, answering questions. Or I asked it something about what proportion of LGBTQ identifying people. This whole thing, it's a long story. Um, we're without electricity during a disaster. Um, and that's um, that entry in the table, and uh, and it got it right. That that number doesn't exist anywhere but in the table, and uh, parsing out the table, it's like, pfft, right? Because that that's not so. It's not as it's not it's not pretty. Um, uh, uh, you can also call it from a notebook. Uh, I threw in because I I have a, a place in Provincetown, and there's. Always public meetings, and I never get to go. And so, um, but I uh, asked uh, from the public meeting information: Can you provide a list of all the art galleries renewing their licenses? And it gives you the list that you want. I mean, so so um, so, Chat PDF is providing access to you. You upload a bunch of PDFs. It's running. Uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo in the background um, and running something called RAG or Retrieval Augmented Generation. Um, uh, another, another useful framework to work with if you have a series of documents or some kind of knowledge base you'd, you'd like is, is a, 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 a bot creation platform by Quora called Poe. Um, Poe uh, invites you to build a bot. Um, and my co-instructor uh, for my class this semester, uh, Gina Chua, um, she uh, is, I think, head of the uh, Trans Journalists Association. And they have a trans journalist style guide. She loaded it up and then said, for any story that, that you would like, um, uh, how does this compare to the, the standards that are in the style guide? And can you provide some guidance? Um, so Poe is like a, a really easy. Uh, easy bot making um, piece. I, I'm going to go without that. Um, well, I will say there's like research to be had. We had a paper in Kai about about angles. Um, you know, based on some press release, can you identify what interesting reporting angles there might be? We had another piece in Kai this year about uh, using news stories and generating TikTok storyboards from them even though GPT is not very good at being funny. Um, uh, and then we had a piece um, uh, that was looking at legislation and identifying um, uh, w what, what administrative unit was impacted, um, uh, uh, how it was impacted, and, and who gets impacted. Um, so it's pulling apart legal language. And this was for some work we were doing with the census. 
because as you all probably know, being good social scientists, the census 2020 added noise to the small geographies. So we wanted to know all the places where laws referenced numbers, like the census count of your county in Wyoming has to be more than 4,000 to get a court. Well, is 4,000 low enough in the noise that you might not get a court just because of the vagaries of the noise at the Census Bureau? So you have hard thresholds with noisy, noisy data. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, so there's a lot of work going on about prompting. I mean, a lot of research about prompting um, and different ways in which um, you might optimize your prompt to, to get you the, the kinds of um, responses that you want. Um, uh, there's also a move um, toward uh, using LLMs um, not just as assistants, but as agents that have a certain degree of agency, right? That go out and do things for you. Um, so, uh, and that's, that's, it's things like Langchain or Baby AGI. Um, uh, and uh, Langchain will do things um, uh, 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 like, 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 um, like this. Um, so uh, at the very top, I give, or here, tool names, I give, um, I give uh, the large language model two, um, two tools, a Google search um, and, a, and a, uh, a math engine, because we know that it's not good with math. Um, and then, uh, uh, and so, so, so now you're, and you tell, and, and along with that, the language model gets a description of what the tool does and how to invoke it. Right, so a Google search is for searching the internet about contemporary things, right? And you do it by using this URL with a Q equals for your query term, and this is how you ask for stuff. And so I asked it, you then pose to the agent, you invoke something like, who is older, Trump or DeSantis? Take the difference between their ages and take the square root. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. Um, and it comes back and says, sure. Um, uh, I got to find out the age of Trump and DeSantis first. It's, it says the action it needs to take is a search. Um, then uh, uh, the... Uh, Input is Trump's age. It observes it's 77. It says, huh, I think I found his age. Now I'd find Santos's age. Ah, found it to be 45. Um, now I need to find the difference, and I need to use the calculator to take the square root of the difference between the two, and away you go. All right, so I, yeah, okay. Um, here's this one. Who is taller, Trump or Biden, and represent the difference between Trump and Biden's heights as a fraction of Obama's height? Ha. <laughs> um, and it did that too. Um, Anyway, so you get the idea that uh, we've gone from predict, predict what comes next to this notion of an assistant to the notion of a tool using agent, right? Which is, is these are all very strong like narrative, narrative shifts or shifts in imagination. How about that? Um, and it, it's not perfect. I asked it about money and uh, I probably should give it the API for open secrets and then away it could go, but it didn't know where to find. Uh, this is a question about how, who made more money uh, or raised more money. Was it DeSantis or Trump? Um, and then um, coming toward the end, uh, all of these things can be run, like uh, step one for a journalist can't be giving your, your precious data to open AI. If you've just scraped it from a website, well, they probably have it already anyway. But if, if, it's, if, it's, if it's like this precious FOIA request, the last thing I want to do is just give it to, to the government, or, or give it, to, sorry, give it to OpenAI, who doesn't have, what, who God knows what subpoena protection they have or whatever, right? So, so um, you can run these models. Increasingly, you can run them locally. I've been using something called LM Studio. Has anyone tried that? LM Studio, do you like it? Right, so there's a, there's a website called Hugging Face that has a lot of open source models, and uh, LM Studio provides you with um, uh, access to those models in a really clean way. Um, you can get them up and running quickly and then try them out. It's obviously going to be slower because it's on your machine, but, um, but not every task has to be a heavy lift. Some of the tasks you do will be, will be smaller and whatever, but there's a lot of these. Um, uh, 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 GPT for all, um, private GPT, web LLM is really interesting. It's running in your browser, which is kind of cool. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, so then some last moment. Uh, we're just going to end on a downer. 
<laughs> Buckle up. Um, uh, so, uh, so all of this seems like fun and games, and we should be playing. Let's give it a try. It's it's not always it's not always um, uh, a giggly, buttery slide to the bottom, right? Um, uh, uh, so a couple weeks ago, uh, the institute I run hosted an event with uh, Alondra Nelson and um, Julia Angwin. Um, there were a bunch of uh, of um, uh, of uh, election officials, along with uh, uh, AI experts and some data journalists. Uh, five models were on display, so uh, ChatGPT and Claude and uh, Mistral and, and um, uh, Gemini. And, um, uh, and then uh, there were, I think, six groups. And each group um, had uh, like five questions, like, do you need an ID to vote in LA? Um, and you had the California, a California election official there who would, who would then see the answer and go, yes, no, that seems misleading, that's a problem. Um, and, you know, there were a lot of, there were a lot of, confu there was a lot of confusion. And, and much of it had to do with the timing because these models stopped, like they're only trained up to a certain time period. Um, so if there was a new website or new information, it wouldn't be included. Um, uh, it also tended not to refer people to the, to the websites that the election officials wanted them referred to. Um, so, so there's that. So using, using the, the system's world knowledge can be problematic if, if it requires something really current. Um, uh, and then um, my friend who runs GDELT did, uh, did this experiment that I thought wouldn't work. Um, but he asked Claude and, and GPT or whatever, um, uh, tell me a short story about a doctor and a nurse. And in one, two, three, four, well, I did 10 of them. All 10, the doctor was male and the nurse was female. Um, you do the same in GPT-4, tell me a story about a doctor and a nurse, and it comes up the same. Um, uh, there have been various attempts to try to, to quantify GPT's gender bias. Um, uh, 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 this particular blog post, and ooh, we repeated that in class. We repeated it in class. Um, looked at uh, a data set. It's called the Winnow Bias data set, um, uh, and it's a it's a, a problem in co-referencing. So you have a, a like. Entity one does something to entity two, um, then there's a pronoun in some circumstance. And the question is, who does that pronoun belong to? Um, and the, 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 the gender of the pronoun doesn't, doesn't help the situation, right? The, you could swap in he or she, and you should get the same answer, right? Um, it's just that in some cases, the, the, they are uh, stereotype aligned, meaning uh, hairdresser she, and in some cases, they're misaligned um, uh, 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 construction worker she, right? And the alignment here is according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and how many people are employed in those particular professions. So that it's not it's not like one stereotype on top of another. Um, but uh, and so so it um, so you can ask one of these sentences. Uh, they're just a series of sentences. The housekeeper troubles the physician a lot because she uh, knows about medicine. Um, and then you ask the question, who knows about medicine? And the GBT says, the housekeeper. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and so um, uh, the, the issue here is, uh, does the system perform this task much better on the, the, the stereotype-aligned sentences than on the non-aligned, the pro versus anti? And it turns out that the, the stereotype aligned GPT-4 does much better than, than the anti-aligned, and that, that shows a degree of, of bias. That's one way people are trying to get at it. Um, uh, uh, Bloomberg just had a piece out about, um, about how uh, uh, if you use, uh, you feed uh, OpenAI a series of, um, of resumes, um, uh, it will uh, tend to and ask them to rank the resumes, um, and they're you know subject to certain uh, s certain balance conditions of, of, of male female and so on. Um, uh, 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 top ranked surveys more often than should be were were listed as a Asian uh, uh, Asian uh, names as opposed to um, as opposed to black or Hispanic. 
Um, and so you, you, these biases um, come up. I, you probably saw this in Bloomberg as well. Um, uh, uh, provide for me a color photograph of a CEO um, versus a color photograph of a dishwa dishwasher work. Um, or uh, uh, this is the Washington Post. Give me a picture of toys in Iraq. Or give me a portrait of a person playing soccer or cleaning. Um, and then Dolly 3 s saw a lot of that coming. And in their system card, this is just their public. They make this available when they published Dolly 3. Um, uh, 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 they... Um, they, they ended up having to have GPT-4 rewrite stuff because for a, um, a prompt like an individual enjoying a leisurely picnic in the park uh, with an array of snacks spread out on a checkered blanket, that's what uncontrolled GPT or Dolly gave, right? I, I don't even know what to do with that. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then after, after Dali, like the rewriting, we get something like this. And then a similar sort of thing. Um, I, I mean, it, 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 it's quite striking. And so, so, how to, so, so you can kind of get the sense of like these biases show up in ways, but how are we going to keep whacking these down? Like how, because it, it pops up in places. It's not, it, 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 it's an implicit thing. It's not so much the, anyway. Um, Oh, and this is George Boole. <laughs> I mentioned him at the beginning. Um, I just said I want a portrait of George Boole shugging his shoulders, and this is what it gave me instead. Um, uh, so this is a whole series on shadow prompting. Um, uh, okay, so, oh, one last thing. Um, uh, and, then I'll, and then I'll stop. I, it'll take two minutes. Um, you think that the, that, that the bias comes in uh, maybe, you know, just, just, the, just uh, through having it write stuff, right? And, and letting it, like, express itself. Like, maybe that's where the problem is. So if I keep to code, maybe I'm okay, right? Like, if I just have coding, um, like, like Python or R or something like that. And so here, um, we were looking with, at the Household Pulse Survey, just a survey that the Census Bureau offers. And we, and it, we wanted to make sure that we, we knew the response rate was really low. It's like a 10% response rate. So do some of the variables match the population? Like, does the age distribution match the population or whatever? So we asked it to write some code because um, we hadn't done visualization yet. And it gave us this for the, for the, for the distribution of ages. You all probably know better than I do whether this looks sensible or not. Um, uh, and I was like, well, so how are we going to figure out if this is sensible or not? And they were very quiet. And we had just had the head of the ACS talk to us, right, like a week before. And I was like, gosh, wouldn't it be great if there was a government agency that every 10 years took the population of the United States and could tell us if this was a reasonable thing or this was just because people didn't fill out the form? Um, and so we went to the Census Bureau. And the Census Bureau had these lovely things called population pyramids. Do you guys have, like... You, so it's basically like uh, uh, the, the number of males and females um, and then grouped into, into, into five-year chunks uh, as you go up, right? And so there are fewer people of my vintage and so on. Um, and so what I wanted to compare was like this guy here. And so I wrote to GPT and I said, hey, GPT, um, oops. I said, hey, GPT, um, uh, uh, I'd, like a, I'd like to make a population pyramid. My data frame has a column, blah, blah, blah. Um, these, these plots are really cool. Um, can you, you know, do this for me? Blah, blah, blah. And uh, it happily did it. But what's the difference between this plot and this plot? Right, it's got like gendered colors, right? And I was like, GPT, <laughs> internet, <laughs> like, um, like so. Even in like subtle choices of variable names and colors and things like that, like th these biases are gonna leak in, um, right? So how do I build a bomb? So okay, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you very much for your attention.